When it comes to crime solving, Sherlock Holmes Chapter 1 does not mess around. Whether I was investigating a crime scene, interviewing a person of interest, or drawing conclusions that would determine someone's guilt or innocence, Chapter 1 absolutely never held my hand. If I missed some critical pieces of evidence and accused the wrong person of murder, oh well, an innocent man goes to prison and I get to walk around thinking I've delivered justice. How could she do this? If I found someone committed murder but decided to let them go free anyway, that was totally my prerogative. This complete lack of any kind of safety net or morality system to nudge me in one direction or another was a breath of fresh air that made my short time with Chapter 1 far more interesting than a straightforward adventure game. After all, I'm supposed to be the world's most brilliant mind and a masterful detective. Why shouldn't I be expected to put the pieces together myself or fail in the effort? Even though Chapter 1 takes place during Holmes' early days as a 21-year-old upstart, Sherlock seems ever confident in his knack for observation and reasoning in the section I played, and the short introductory quest immediately required me to put those skills to the test. With my childhood friend John at my side, I dove into a murder mystery involving a mystifying seance and characters with secret pasts and hidden motives. In one section, I used my enhanced talent for observation to discover which person in a crowd had a military background, and in another, I eavesdropped on some gossip to learn about a scandalous affair. Many steps and clues in the investigation were missable if I didn't notice a detail or made an error in logic, which could lead me down a path to unknowingly identifying the wrong killer. And unless I made a habit out of saving and reloading as often as possible, Chapter 1 did nothing to nudge me in the right direction. And I appreciate that about it. Can you describe the thief for me? That said, sometimes Chapter 1's odd way of presenting information and somewhat clunky menus led to errors that felt unearned while others happened organically as I missed a beat somewhere along the way. Either way, I was expected to figure it out or suffer the consequences, and that's the beauty of Chapter 1. Nailing a puzzle and feeling like an erudite sleuth is awesome precisely because it feels so well earned. It seems there may have been an unexpected visitor outside the window. On the other hand, making a mistake often left me in disbelief at just how little the game cared if I was successful or not. All the while, John followed me around making notes in his diary as his opinion of me shifted based on my performance. The fact that Sherlock is young and perhaps a little more cocky than he should be serves Chapter 1 well, because either he's young and still brilliant as ever, or he's overconfident and has a lot to learn. With my success or failure, I got to decide which Sherlock I was. And in a world where lots of games make you feel like you're bowling with bumpers on, this level of freedom was incredibly refreshing, even when it felt a bit harsh. Your best strategy now is to confess and hope your reasons were justified. The small glimpse I got of Chapter 1's open world island of Cordona felt equally unrestrictive. With optional side quests, locations, and events I can take in at my own pace, the prospect of a brutally Darwinistic open world crime solving game is incredibly appealing. But because my time in the open world aspect of Chapter 1 was so limited, it remains to be seen if something so ambitious can even work. I'm sure a lot of learnings from the developer's previous game, The Sinking City, will be applied. Either way, it's piqued my curiosity quite a bit, and I'm excited to see if they can pull it off. For more on Sherlock Holmes, don't miss the official gameplay reveal trailer, and for everything else in the world of video games, keep snooping around IGN.